What is the role of the modern MBA? What role do business schools fill in our modern society? How do they help us not only evolve in terms of our career, but in terms of who we are as a person? We sit down with our wonderful guest, director and dean of the Henley Business School, John Foster Pedley, to talk about his fascinating career, or as he describes it, not having had a career, but rather a series of roles. If you're considering an MBA or going to business school, or just would like to hear a fascinating conversation with a fascinating individual about a fascinating life, this one is for you. Welcome to Coffee and Conversations with Champions, the Leadership Edition. A big welcome and thank you for joining us. We're chatting to John Foster Pedley. Did I get that right, John? You did, okay. John Foster Pedley. Excellent, thank you. So John, you're Dean and Director of the Henley Business School, Africa, Vice yep. Chairman of the South African Business School Association. Absolutely fantastic. And no, no, actually, no, I, I used to be vice chair of that. I'm okay. now chair of the Association of African Business Schools. I'm the vice okay. chair, previous chair of the British Chamber of Business in Southern Africa. Okay. Yeah. Sure. <coughs> Sorry, I gave you an old CV. No, no, that, that's even better. Thank you. Um, I, I get nervous with reading and reading names. And what I did recently was I was the announcer for the Asia Pacific and Africa powerlifting championships so having to read some of the asian names very difficult. oh i, I can and, i feel i feel you for know, you it, it was and and but but they were all very good sports about it and uh, i got teased a lot and it was all in good fun so. <laughs> yeah. so john thank you so much for your time and for joining us today so, it's an absolute pleasure i mean you've told me a little bit about yeah. you and i feel rather honored to be interviewed by you actually yeah. And as I said in a preliminary, I wish I were interviewing you. But anyway, next time. Yeah, absolutely. We, we can swap roles. Yeah. Absolutely, with pleasure. Yeah, yeah. I think it's very kind of you to say. So, John, can you give us a little bit about your background? And I, I love the quote um, that you shared in your CV. You know, I've not had a career. I've just had a series of roles. And it's absolutely <laughs> wonderful. Yes, uh, that was uh, originally from an actress who was being interviewed. Tell us about your career. She said, Darling, I've just had a series of roles, not a career. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I'm, as you can tell from my voice, I'm originally British. I've, I've been in South Africa 30 years this time and about five years another time and spent another five or six years doing business in Africa and another five years living in France, another while living in New Zealand. So I've been around quite a bit. And my very kind uh, help here, Kirsty, has brought me a coffee. Thank you, Kirsty. And um, so I was yeah, brought up private schools, middle class in Britain with a military family. My father was a war hero. Uh, all my family went to the Royal Air Force. Um, so did I. I got a scholarship to military academy, actually, as a pilot, and really enjoyed that. Spent a year doing that. And then, my, then they wanted their career officers to get degrees. And I went off to study in London at a time when everything was free thinking, Vietnam War protests, the emergence of the hippie, all the sort of counter cultural intellectuals going Aldous Huxley, Timothy Leary, and all all that time. And it was just like amazing to be in that. And I realized that probably I could do other things in life as well, wisely or unwise. I don't know to this day whether it was. I decided to buy my way out of the Air Force after about three years wanting to be a writer, which I never really did until recently, and then explore life a bit more. And then after a long circuitous route, which involved many manual jobs and meeting all sorts of people I would never have met ever in my life and uh, all sorts of things. Eventually, come 28, I decided, or maybe a bit younger, that I'd better pull my life together again in a more conventional sense. <clears throat> and I, um, I got a job selling airplanes, built up some flying hours, Got my life, private license, borrowed a lot of money, commercial license, and then I became a flying instructor, commercial airline pilot, and doing a lot of aerobatics on the side, and uh, did that for a few years. So that was my competition with aerobatics. And then I, um, I came back to the UK, because <clears throat> I was in South Africa then, but my mum was sick and joined British Aerospace to sell airliners in Africa and the Middle East. We made them, I would try and sell them. 
that was an incredible apprenticeship. <clears throat> and then I was very lucky to have a boss who sponsored me, allowed me to sponsor a very expensive MBA in Europe at Ashridge, where I discovered MBA and learning and teaching. And I thought I'd start teaching part time, uh, which I did, speaking strategy. Got a job in France as a marketing director. And then at the end of that, I decided as South Africa was changing again, I would come back to South Africa, believe it or not, as some sort of academic. And bizarrely, I got all sorts of job offers. And eventually, I joined the uh, University of Cape Town, teaching strategy on their MBA, designed and ran their executive MBA, headed up exec ed, worked in New Zealand for a while, running an incubator. And then about 12, 13 years ago, the job of dean of this very tiny business school in South Africa called Henley, which is part of a very big international business school. And we've managed to grow it without any investment at all just through doing really good work from five people to 120 to now being as big as the biggest competitor in South Africa in terms of our corporate education and um, grown, our, grown our revenue by multiples of tens and built a really strong reputation, I hope, for doing really careful work, doing what's behind me, building the people who build the businesses that build Africa. And uh, I really enjoy doing that and being part of an exceptional team and it's been a very interesting journey and we've learned a lot in the process. That's me. And I'm very lucky to have two lovely kids and a wife, a lovely wife, and uh, play very bad guitar. That's my other thing. Okay. Excellent. <laughs> what, what, what kind of guitar? Well, uh, in, terms of it, in terms of the music, I, yeah. I do enjoy blues, folk blues, right. Johnny Clegg music, that sort of stuff. And I have a range of actual guitars, you know, so acoustic okay. and electric. Yeah. Have you been in a band? Yeah. Are you in a band? Um, very temporarily. I've been in yeah. little bands called Peroxide Blue and The Metaphors and the Bunk Girls Motorcycle Group. We went to see do a Dan Platansky weekend. Dan's a brilliant South African guitarist. Yeah. And the group of us were staying in the girls, Bunk Girls, in the, in the backpackers a few years ago. These are all kind of senior executives and well-known people. And we formed this little band called the Bunk Girls. And um, I was given a absolute privilege to be on stage with the um, the Johnny Clegg band after Johnny Clegg had passed, the remainders of that, uh, many of whom are studying with Henley, actually, and are fantastic people. And they allowed me to sit on stage with them and with Khan of the Parlor Tones and a few other people playing and being part of this, like, you know, like being a, it's like driving an old Ford Toyota down in, down in the countryside up the back hill somewhere and suddenly you're on the Formula One track. It was an amazing experience and they were incredibly generous. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely wonderful. I wanted to ask you about the MBA, but from a, perhaps a, a slightly different angle. In your experience working with people or seeing people doing their MBAs, what do people learn about themselves from doing an MBA? Well, MBAs are the same and very different. So it depends where you go and what you're doing. Some MBAs are very content based, they're a bit like a, doing an undergrad degree. Others, ones that are much more, I would say, sophisticated, are really focused on building people's intellectual capabilities. You know, a lot of people here don't think they're very clever in South Africa because only 5% of them who school, start school get to do a degree. Right. They think it's because they're not clever. I think some of them, it's absolutely not true. We're blessed with some incredibly clever people who never had a chance to do degrees. And one of our biggest joy is getting them into learning and them, and them understanding that for themselves. Oh, I just, I was really clever all the time. Why didn't somebody tell me? Well, we'll tell you and we'll prove it to you. So that's a big joy of our work. So it depends on the MBA in terms of personal development. In all truth, the Henley MBA, and I'm not here to do a pun for Henley, I'm really not. The Henley MBA is, had, was once ranked by The Economist as the number one in the world for personal development. Mm -hmm. And it's still really exceptional. People don't do an MBA for personal development necessarily. But if you ask nearly everyone who does, does the M, our MBA and many others, we don't indulge in competitive selling really. It's a personal development thing that's changed them. Mm -hmm. And this is about you know understanding who you are, understanding your limiting assumptions, understanding how other people and you think, giving giving respect and credence to your feelings, your emotions, learning how to reflect, learning methods to, to test yourself and grow, getting more psychological literacy, um, 
encourage getting a bit more activists, um, finding your courage and finding um, your fears as well, the things that stop you growing, particularly I mustn't, I mustn't be odd, I mustn't be different, I mustn't be different from the pack in corporate. Well, the reality is that most of the great inventions, most of the corporations and big companies you see now came from people who were not, weren't fitting the bill. I mean, even, even, even discovery, you know, who would have thought that the most, one of the most innovative companies in, in the world, I would say, and certainly in South Africa, was founded by a bunch of actuaries, you know? Right, yeah. <laughs> and, and it just proves the lie about actuaries. These, these are amazing people and they're very creative. So, um, yeah, so, so I think the MBA can do an awful lot for you in terms of your personal confidence. Mm. It also yeah. develops your intellect, but not as an intellectual per se, but as somebody who takes the capabilities of the brain and can then deal with greater degrees of complexities, greater degrees of relational complexities, uh, can understand how to work with and get the best out of other people. And it also it's a great leveler. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I think stops people growing is the sense that I have to be special. I have to be unique. I always have to show up as special. Now, my belief is show up as ordinary. Be as ordinary as you can. Oh, how can you say that, John? Because ordinary is so... No, ordinary is magic. You know, ordinary is all the capabilities that all our brains have that we never really access. The ordinary brain is brilliant. It's just very poorly used. Learn how to use it all. And, and we stigmatize each other because we may be neurodiverse or dyslexic or something like that. It's absolute nonsense. You know, take dyslexia, for example. Listen to Richard Branson and many other great leaders. They, they would call their dyslexia their gift because it forces them to see things through first principles and that get, not get hung up in sort of verbal concepts, but see and act. Um, and the same with a lot of other of those things that we tend to think. So... I like to think of people as, as really having a good capability with ordinary brains and just learning to use them well. And that will allow us, that's the freedom, because then you realize that you can grow and that you can really achieve a lot of things. Not anything, and certainly not everything, but a huge amount. Right. Yeah. And what has that being involved with the program done for you in terms of speaking about service and uh, giving back or aiding and assisting? People. Well, well, at Henley, we do a lot of programs. The MBA is only about 40% of what we do. And we've just launched a new global MBA coming out in a couple of months with five international visits and a doctorate and a whole range of other programs. But when I did my MBA, it was, it was unexpected because part of the reason I did an MBA is because I dropped out of my, my degree and um, decided I wanted to be a free thinker and travel the world and explore all these amazing things going on at the time and uh, which I, I kind of did for a while and i thought well i don't know all this business jargon and when i left flying and went into a corporate job people were talking about stuff i didn't really understand so i thought well i better learn quickly and so um i found out about an mba it said i wanted to armor myself against the jargon everyone was throwing away little did i know it would be like entering into a a really magic land of discovery of ideas and concepts and practices and um, skills and expertise that that I've really enjoyed. And I particularly enjoyed the strategic work, which was really complex patterning, if you like, mm -hmm. um, and the personal development work. And I think what happened for me is it felt like coming home. And I felt myself a surge of growth. And it wasn't career related per se, because I changed my my what I did after that quite quickly a couple of times but it was more like following following my growth and my interests and I think that's what happens to a lot of people they they often do an MBA because they want to do well in their career and because it's a, almost a rite of passage to be recognized mm -hmm. but a good MBA will do so much more than that it'll give you the qualifications it'll give you the recognition particularly like with us you get an international degree not not, not only a local one um, but what it does is teach them about themselves and those things that they've been do too deeply channeled into maybe at school um, or they've been channeled inappropriate. It allows them to open out of it and see what else they know about themselves. And in that, they start to see new opportunities emerging for themselves and new possibilities and new interests emerge. And they understand that they can go in different directions. There's a wonderful book 
Britain called squiggly careers. And so the careers don't go in straight lines, they're squiggling around. And it's, most of our careers are like that. And it's a myth that you go down one, for most people you go down one, one thing. And anyway, in that myth, what have you missed? You know, to play on words a bit, you know. <laughs> so I think that you, you've got the opportunity to reframe yourself, redirection, recompose yourself, and to discover so much more of you than often a corporate life will allow you to do because you are being you are being used in the skill set that you have whereas you have so much more available to you and isn't it fantastic to discover that and maybe find that your contribution to life can be so much wider and more interesting because it's such a good point that you i mean you touched on many but saying that the corporate is using you for the skill set that you have but that skill set is because that's what you're aware of. That's what you maybe were told to develop and told to focus on. And that's what you're then bringing to the table. But if you can learn that you're capable of more and you have more to develop, you become you know, better as a person and perhaps better in your role as well. Well, I think so. I mean, I'd encourage people when they're going to their careers is, is absolutely, I mean, get a qualification, it's good. Don't think that qualification is going to define you. Do one that tests and develop your mind. And then you need some deep skills to make you employable. So people will often do a digital or finance or something like that. Those are good. But you can get a lot of those skills, not at a university or business school, but online now through credentialization, through LinkedIn Learning or Udemy or Coursera, all those things. So keep building up your skill sets. But then there's other things that really make success. And the quality of your thinking, the quality of how you build relationships, um, how you can help other people, um, the quality of your purpose, incredibly important mm -hmm. because you, you can focus just on making a lot of money. And often that is important in various parts of your career. Um, but I think later you realize that when you've got enough to live on, let's say, that there are many more important things that are going to drive you and give you a sense of meaning and purpose and, and actually excitement and be able to do multiple things. So I think get all those qualifications, but don't think they define you. Be ready to learn and relearn because, because of the pace of change that we're facing now, you don't really necessarily know what you could be or what's needed in a few years or even what you will make because there's this truism that everybody is everybody at university gets an E which is because you're training to get an E, which is an employee. <laughs> the other E would be entrepreneur, but anyway, so, yeah. so, so think that, keep control of your own aspirations of your own minds, use the qualifications, they'll be used by them or defined by them, and understand that we are so rich in our capabilities and the causes that we have to respond to in life, you know, like a just society, a fair society, mm -hmm giving people opportunity where there's so much poverty. Those are not bleeding heart issues. They are actually economic issues. How can any of our kids have a decent future, really, unless all of our kids have a decent future? Absolutely. Because you're going to, you know, society that that's skewed will be unlivable, as you can often see in terms of crime and many other things. So I think university learning is a, is a great, great start. You don't have to go to uni. But then learn, learn in action, learn about yourself and learn and experiment. Um, because, you know, you need, we, we, we tend to teach people one thing and often suddenly you're a bit more senior, you're supposed to be strategic or creative or innovative. Well, if you spent 20 years driving innovation out of people and telling them they're wrong, if they do anything off, that's off submission, they're not exactly going to be easily able to switch. So I think, I think you need to train people in their use their imagination, which is a huge business asset. How are you going to vision if you don't have imagination? How are you going to speculate what you could be if you can't imagine it? Um, and then help people also um, develop their, their ability to think out of the box. One of the things I've seen with quite neurodiverse people and also quite dyslexic people, funnily enough, is that they are able to look at a problem and not use a set of concepts to be guided how they have to use it. They get very, very good what I call first principle thinking. And I think Elon Musk is good at this as well. Although, you know, you look at something and say, you don't think why well, you can't do it. You work out, actually, is this doable? And you deconstruct it and you make it possible to do it. And you see how it could be done. Now, 
often if you're educated or you have a profession, you've been told you have to do it in these ways, you can't really easily see that. In fact, when somebody says you could do it differently, you think they're crazy. Right. Um, but, you know, it's a good attribute to develop, I think. Be careful because you, yeah. you could always go over the top, but, you know, <laughs> give it a go. <laughs> it's, it's definitely something that needs, that needs to be managed. So yeah. <laughs> we're, we're touching on the entrepreneurial aspect, and I think for many South Africans, uh, university, even high school, is not an option, and they, they either move into employment or into the entrepreneurial role. How valuable, uh, and we, we've touched on a few of the points, but would doing an MBA be for the entrepreneur? And within that context, what is different within the MBA within South Africa versus the rest of the world, or even Africa? Well, let, let me start with the last question. Yeah, I, I, I think an M, an M, an M, an M, no, 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 an MBA oh, means yeah, yeah. Masters of Business, exactly. business Administration. Yes. Let me tell you, you're not going to learn to be a master of business administration and doing an MBA mostly. Yeah. I mean, it depends how you define administration. You might be a master in building Acumen. You might be a master in building Africa. Uh, you might be joining the, the Marriage Breakup Academy, which we don't want to do. So we make our MBA very family friendly. Okay. So that's the reason I can explain. And uh, in fact, some people have had plenty of kids that have made it the Making Babies Academy. Um, you know, so, so but so an MBA, I'm playing with the word because I want to deconstruct the, deconstruct the idea. There are many different types of MBAs. You can basically, you can do it on a very content driven one. And when you're more senior, you know a lot of that. You want to do it much more about execution or big picture thinking or strategic thinking, etc. If you think of an MBA not as a business qualification per se, but as a really interesting way to understand how the world of, of business works, and let me define the world of business. It's uh, anybody who's giving anybody something to somebody else in exchange for some value, value for value exchange. So anything, can be, all the creative arts, anything is, is business in a sense. It, it's a way of getting, creating value for people and sustaining it, often through money. And it doesn't, and, and profit is not the purpose of business. It's, it's, it's one of the necessary things to sustain yourself, unless you're in a non-profit organization, which could be a non-profit business. Right. So I think the right. MBAs uh, in South Africa, uh, you've got some really good ones. You've got uh, triple accredited schools, like you've got Gibbs, you've got UCT, Stellenbosch, I think, and of course us. We're quadruple accredited because we're also quadruple accredited by the Association of African Business Schools as is, I know, uh, Gibson, I think, Ritz. Um, so uh, you, you note I'm mentioning all our competitors because one thing we don't do at Henley is indulge in competitive selling. Mm -hmm. What we do, we think we need as many good business schools as possible because we've got a lot of people who need educating. So that's I, I would rather talk them up than talk them down. That's, that's a credo we have. So I think what they do is bring you lots of things. Um, so you can do some good MBAs. If you're going to do an MBA, go to the schools with the best reputation that feel best for you. Try and get international qualifications if you can. Not the South African ones aren't good. They are very good. But mm -hmm. if you're looking at an international career, it'll probably give you more, more kind of leverage. Not necessarily. I don't want to position us unfairly. Um, and then across Africa, you've also got a number of other good business schools. American University of Cairo, Lagos Business School, Strathmore in uh, Lagos, uh, Strathmore is in Kenya, and, and other schools that are, that are good. Um, but there are not quite as many as you would find in Europe. You get a patchy, a patchy thing, but there's two things about an MBA. You've got an MBA, you've got a clever MBA that packages all things around it so you can do a lot more. You've got an MBA that's applied that makes you think about your own organization and is, uh, gives you time to learn rather than cramming all in. This is our model. Um, and then on top of all that, it depends what you bring to it. You know, so you can do an MBA at 70% effort and get 70% out, and you can do an MBA at more effort and get way more out of it, all the intangibles. And then a really good school, it's not about the syllabus of the MBA, it's the tone, it's the culture, it's the, it's the challenge, the provocation, the enthusiasm, the belief in you. Um, if you find, if you go to a difficult place that makes you slightly annoyed and you want to argue, you know, that's probably a good sign. 
Right. You know, we want our we want our MBA students to be revolting. I mean, revolting in a revolutionary sense, not in the other way. <laughs> Where they're, they're never revolting in the other way. They're, they're wonderful people. Um, so, you know, we that's it. So, in terms of entrepreneurship, it's a very interesting thing. The truth is that if you look at statistics for successful entrepreneurs, you take somebody in their forties and fifties, even sixties, and uh, they're tend to be much more successful as as first as early entrepreneurs for obvious reasons they've learned they've learned in the stage so their failure rates lower and they'll probably grow quicker businesses so if you want to solve youth entrepreneurship we immediately try and make entrepreneurs out of youths which is a good idea of course but why don't we make loads more entrepreneurs of people who are doing well in corporations help them out to start their businesses, force the, the corporations then to really train up people because they're going to be recruiting people they're going to need more. That's going to force the institutions to keep producing people who are more business-like. So push the middle-aged people out to start many more businesses mm -hmm. who will recruit youth and then train them up by being mentored by people who already know what they're doing. And you've got a different dynamic. Of course, you should learn entrepreneurship skills, which are mainly, I think, to do around psychological resilience, not, not the use of money. Mm -hmm. um, there's, there's research that shows that you teach people to be more resilient in early stages. They're more successful than, than if you teach them how to do a business plan. Right. You know, so it's an interesting piece of research. So you have to understand what it takes to, to be successful. So I think that good, the good MBAs are always conscious of this. They're always self-critical. They're always moving forward and uh, restless in a sense. The ones that are not restless and not self-critical are probably not really worth doing. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you want to come out of an MBA with a, a lot of growth, a lot of aspiration, a lot of vision and certain restlessness and a sense not that you're a smart-ass MBA, a Samba, but to, to you're more like the lion, the shrewd, in, interpersonal, interpretive MBA. Right. You know, the one who's going to be inventing themselves all their life and looking for the opportunities and excited by what the world offers. So we, we touched on sort of corporates having to upskill and train in, in, in the ideal world. What, what responsibility should, and it's difficult to tell people what responsibility they should take, but what responsibility should corporates take in upskilling their staffs, making the MBAs available perhaps to everybody? And, uh, you know, how, how can that change our situation as a country? Well, the reality of many corporates or many organizations is that you know, contrary to popular opinion, that they're not sitting on masses of cash. Some of them are, well done them. But they also have masses of risks. And so it's quite hard for people. Everyone wants corporations to do something. But corporations are in a market that requires them to pay off shareholders, to continue growth, to be in quite risky environments and make sure they're getting decent profits in. And it's to add an obligation to them that they have to do training is, is probably not the right way. The right way to think about it is, is I think that it's very hard for you to be successful if you're if you're not going to be um, if you're not going to be training people. And also you're going to be a great employer if people know they come to you and, and it's going to be a university in its own right. And you'll have a dynamic of learning in that place, which again will be slightly restless, slightly interesting, and it'll be a culture where people will be kind of not it's like competitive, but competitive yeah. with people in the same race, you know, yes. you know, with your colleague, you can chat afterwards, you're not trying to kill each other, you know, and I think a market should be like that too, by the way. So I think that corporations really need to develop, but there's another way around it as well. I think there is an obligation because when corporations are polluting, like you see, you go to the East Rand, you go to our, the areas here, and the air quality is, is, dangerous you see what's happened to the environment you see the pollution that's going on you see what um you see that people we have so much poverty and and the apartheid system deliberately excluded people from doing high level sort of works yeah. a criminal awful vile act that we we really are get, still suffering the consequences of as you well know you built, um, and you built tenacity out of people you, you, you built, yeah, yes yeah they learned helplessness absolutely yeah. And then people say, you know, they must do this. 
for me. It's, it's an awful psychological trap that, that we are still still struggling with, and sometimes a lack of self confidence, which is terrible. Thank God we have such good, capable people mm -hmm. in, in South Africa that are, that are resilient. And when you when the corporation is doing that and creating these consequences, it's no good saying that's not my problem. Actually, what's happening now is that corporations are not just the boundary isn't the profit wall. It's beyond that. The effects you have on society, we all have to be accountable. And some of the effects are environmental. Some of them are on water quality and whatever, climate contribution. Some of them are societal, not helping people get literate, not helping people get in the skills, not in, indulging in, in, in building the infrastructure, only asking government to do that. Particularly a government has been through very hard times through corruption and whatever, and also doesn't have the resources and in many ways uh, needs extra skills as well. Yeah. So and I think the corporation. Yeah, sorry yeah. to interrupt. Exactly, yeah. The people in that position yeah. don't understand those positions, don't actually understand what they're capable of. I, I absolutely agree with that. Mm. And, and I think people go into those positions for a sense of security and status, and that's understandable. Mm. But we have to teach people what they're capable of, and then they would be excited. So just to finish off, I think the corporations have, I think we have an accountability to develop people for the nation, not just yourself. So I think yeah. that the really, I think you have to take that on if you're working in a system, which is South Africa or Africa, you can't pretend that's beyond my accountability as a corporate. It's not like that anymore. You've got to take that accountability and contribute. And that will pay you back in loyalty, skills, credibility, and respect, which will help your business grow mostly. And I think it, and gen, in general society as well, we, we spoke about a safe place for our children. You know, if you're creating a safe place for everybody's kids, uh, a safe future for everybody, then everybody has a safe future. And we had on our campus two weekends ago, or just after Mandela Day, about 70 kids who came from um, the ganglands. And we gave them through the Bright Spark Foundation and an ex GAN leaguer called Welcome Whitboy, who was one of our students, scholarship winners, who now runs that foundation. We gave him a day's play because sure. something like, according to Welcome, something like 330 odd kids have been wounded in crossfire incidents, over 50 killed just in those communities over the, over the last year. I don't know if their stats are right, but I'm sure. So they don't have a safe place to play. There is no safety for them. Mm. How can we, yeah. in good conscience in what we're doing, you know, think that the limits of our business is our profitability and our balance sheet and keeping mm. our shareholders happy? It can never be that anymore. We're, 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 we're part of that. Unless you're consciously trying to remove uh, poverty from society in what you do in some way or another by giving jobs or, or whatever, or giving a value that's more than just financial yeah. value. How can you how can you do that in a corporation? I certainly can't do it in a business school. You have to think very differently about how you work in the world. Right. How, how was it with the kids and the play day? It's it's a very extraordinary experience, you know, because what happens is the kids come, and they can't go out in the streets to play. They, from what I can hear, that they, they can't. So they come. We we set them up here. We didn't have enough stuff to give them i'm looking around at the campus and the garage we, have. we didn't have enough because we we wanted a bit more sponsorship to get mm. toys but we made some very simple stuff mm. it was it was and food it was brilliant it was brilliant um and in that brilliance you're talking to people and we also had 200 women from that community came to campus before 26 of whom had lost families and and, and um, family members uh, and um it's like you're talking to people and thinking what is, how, how can people, how can they endure? And they're thankful, they're very thankful for what you're doing and you can get a charge and say, yeah, I'm doing good, but it, it, it had the opposite effect on me. It made me feel like, wow, I, I just do so little and I feel like such a fraud offering these facilities and giving those some people being grateful because how much more should we be doing? But then something else kicked in, which was that, Actually, people were generally valued what we did. They generally valued coming here, being recognized, being talked to, being given things, having a time out, having the acknowledgement of what was going on with them and feeling that right. people really noticed and cared. And I thought, well, I'll put aside my feelings of inadequacy here 
actually, that is something we can offer. So let's offer it because it does actually generally matter. Don't think big about yourself, but actually give, you know, do that. It's actually worthwhile. And, uh, and it feeds much more to you. You get more out of it than they do, actually. Absol absolutely. The, the, the honest truth. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> You know, the, the point that you touched on, just seeing people and acknowledging them means yeah. the world to them because so not being seen is a very, very difficult thing. I, I just, there was one of the, the garbage collectors with the carts yesterday that was walking towards me on the road and I just stopped and let him through and wave. And I've never seen a face light up like that, like, you know, as opposed to hooting yeah. at him and nearly trying to run him over which I know they experience a lot of, just, just these small acts of yeah. that kindness. And you know, for me, sure, one, one of the greatest things that I do, I, I get to work with a, a foundation in Richmond in Natal called the Butterfly Foundation and go up into the hills and go to these schools where, you know, it, there's no water, there's no electricity, there's nothing, and talk to these kids about surviving abuse, being an alcoholic, building resilience, and just, yeah. I, I, I think I could, I could have just gone there and waved. And the fact that someone took the time to come out and see them was absolutely a game changer. And as I said, I get far more than the, they would ever get. You know? And something else happened to me as well. You, that's fantastic what you're doing. And I remember I, uh, somebody said, come and say hello, give a little speech. And I, I gave a speech and I've been this preacher before everyone was fired up. And I would say something, everyone would say, yeah, clap. And I, there was this real flow of stuff coming to me of appreciation. And for a moment, I said, wow, that's great. And then I realized what a trap that was, mm -hmm. because people need that. If you want to be the, the charismatic pastor or something like that, and you're going to get all that coming to you, you can misuse that thing that's so true. easily. And I suddenly realized what a huge ego and other trap that was. And you have to feel that in yourself. You can't pretend it's not that. I have to feel that 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 could happen to me. Maybe that, and I say I don't want that. But notice those things that happen in those circumstances, because um, actually, you know, the the vulnerabilities of people in those situations are so open to multiple forms of exploitation. And when we go there, we we have to. I think I don't know what to say. You, you just have to try your darnness to 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 learn. But yeah, but the, you know, that's all part of what we do, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. You know, the thing to say is rather give questions than applause. Don't applaud, yes. just ask questions. You know? Thank you for that. That's, uh, thank you very much indeed. That's uh, exactly right. Because to be in those places shouldn't, shouldn't give you a charge for yourself. It should mm. be the, one of some of the most testing, hardest learning experiences where you're trying to give as much of what you've learned in your life Yes. to somebody to people who've probably been through a thousand times more than you have in their lives we could but anyway yeah. you can't take it with you yeah. no you can't <laughs> absolutely you know the, narcotics anonymous have a wonderful expression we we keep what we have by giving it away and uh, i've oh, learned, yeah. wonderful. Uh, i've learned with this is we grow what we have by giving it away uh, and it's just the most profound wonderful experience but as you said, so you have beautiful. to understand what you're there for. Yeah. It's for them, not for yeah. yourself. So. Exactly right. And I think that's incredibly yeah. inspiring what you've just said. Thank you for that. Yeah. Thank you. So it's great. We, we, we've just hit one o'clock, and I know you have an appointment. Um, I do. <laughs> but I, 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 I'm looking at him waiting in the next office. office okay. But um, thank you for the interview. But mainly thank you for for the opportunity to meet you and understand the work you're doing, which is. Um, really inspirational and uh, anything we can do to help let us know um we'd love to i really appreciate it. thank you and from our side uh, one of the things that we love doing is going to um, even challenging locations where no one wants to go and doing uh, training sessions fun boot camps with the kids teaching them the basics of body weight training so that they have something to go back to because what, what I learned, my first day sober, I left the program, I came home, I was in an outpatient program, and I, I sat on my couch with nothing to do. Instead of going to the pub, I came home, and I had all of these voices in my head, and on TV was a program about Charles Atlas, 
you know, the, the developer. I remember Charles Atlas. Yes, yes, yes. yes, yes. The comics and that. And I watched that. Yeah. Like, okay, let me try that. And I started with one push up. And the physical training is a wonderful way to fill time and to build self belief because today I can do one push up. In a week's time, maybe I can do two if I stick with it and I show commitment and I focus and give that time to myself. So those are the things that we, we love to do and we'd, we'd love to be able and to. You became a champion. Yep. It's not too bad. Hey, yeah. And I mean, I'm, <laughs> how crazy is this? I'm representing South Africa in the Commonwealth Champs in a couple of months. In eight are you years. ready? Yeah, not bad for oh, a wow. three year old father. Well, you, <laughs> well, you just got another fan, man. Yeah, thank you, you just got another That's fan. Really yeah. Well. Thank you, James. Right. It's wonderful. So you should apply for one of the scholarships for, for, for our programs. So people who are contributing to society, we don't give them for money, we do them to mm. pay forward to people who are making a difference. And if you'd like to try that, I think you should do it. Now I've said that on your podcast, so you either edit it out or it's there for everyone to hear. No, I, I will. I will commit as as much as studying terrifies me. I will commit to to taking you up on that, and I'm very grateful for that. Thank you. Uh, you'll, you'll be fine. You, you, you wait and see. I know. Yep, That's you, the you've thing. convinced me of that, which is yeah, wonderful. Yeah, good. So, okay. I look forward Great. to chatting again soon as well. So thank you so much. For thank you very time. much, Nicholas. Okay. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.